Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to today's ContainerJournal.com webinar, brought to you by TechStrong and Fairwinds. My name is Cody J. Brown. I'm the host of TechStrong Learning, and we've got an exciting presentation for you today. First, a couple of housekeeping notes. Today's session is being recorded, so if you miss any of our discussion, or you'd like to rewatch or share with a friend, the on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude our live session today. If you have any questions, we want you to go ahead and send those in to us using the Q&A tab, which can be found on the right side of your screen. That's also where you're going to find the chat tab, where we want you to get to know the rest of your audience members. Uh, let us know your thoughts throughout today's program, or just tell us where you're tuning in from. And finally, before we close, we will be giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards, so be sure to stick around to the very end. Our topic today is Kubernetes, guardrails, and why you need them. And I'm joined by Robert Brendan, Vice President of Product Development at Fairwinds, and Kendall Miller, Technology Evangelist at Fairwinds. Robert, Kendall, thank you both for joining me. I'm going to turn the floor over to you. All right. Well, welcome, folks. I'm still uh, getting a few last minute things here prepped, but I think I'm good to go. Glad to have you. Um, we are going to be talking today about Kubernetes guardrails. Kubernetes is still big and new and complicated for most people, and uh, it feels a little bit like driving wild on a road you're unfamiliar with, and it would sure be nice if you knew where those guardrails were so you don't go swerving off, right? Um, I'm going to make lots of guardrails comments throughout this, and uh, some may or may not be particularly coherent. We'll see, but uh, yeah, where are the guardrails? Why are they needed? How do they help you as an organization? What's the relationship between guardrails and service ownership? Uh, we're going to be talking about all those things today. Kubernetes needs some guardrails in the vast majority of situations, and uh, we're going to be talking about that. So let's go ahead and dive in a little bit. First, uh, Robert, we, they, we mentioned your title, but tell us a little bit about what you do at Fairwinds. Yeah, so uh, my name is Robert Brennan. I've been at Fairwinds for a little over three years now. Uh, and I lead up our software development efforts. Um, so I work on uh, a combination of open source projects like Polaris uh, and Goldilocks, um, as well as our commercial offering, Fairwinds Insights. And my name is Kimmel Miller. I've been at Fairwinds for seven years and about a month, which is kind of ridiculous to say out loud. Very long time. Anyways, uh, glad to be here. Kind of done everything in this organization. Happy to talk to you today about guardrails about Kubernetes, about the changing landscape therein of all of these things. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and dive in. So real quick, if you're unfamiliar with Fairwinds, um, Fairwinds looks to be, it's our mission to be a trusted partner for Kubernetes security, policy, and governance. We wanna help organizations ship faster. So we have a long history uh, building and maintaining Kubernetes clusters for organizations in a service capacity. And then from our macro view of all of these organizations running Kubernetes clusters, we started to build a bunch of open source that addressed common problems that we saw these organizations struggle with. We still have a whole bunch of open source. We're going to get a little bit into that towards the end, talk about what some of those projects do, where they fit. Today, our primary focus is building um, a SaaS platform for people who are using Kubernetes and want guardrails. That's why we're talking about this today. Uh, we help organizations implement policy, um, really unify dev, sec, and ops uh, by giving you great defaults out of the box, making it easy to implement across large organizations, et cetera. At the end, we are going to show a brief demo of the software, so stick around. Uh, but that's what Fairwinds does. This is all we do. It's literally Robert's life. He lives and breathes Kubernetes guardrails. So we're excited to be here and talk with you about this. First, before we get started, let's have a polling question. Where are you in your Kubernetes journey? And, uh, Cody will pull that up. Are you just learning about containers and Kubernetes? Are you planning on using it in six to 12 months, the next six to 12 months? Um, maybe you're only using it in testing or development. Or are you already using it in production? And we uh, use this same poll kind of in all of our webinars and sort of track people's progress into Kubernetes over time. And so it's a useful uh, detail for us. Click a button. Tell us where you are. Good to have a feeling as we go. Also, there is a place uh, in 
this tool, big marker that we're using where you can ask questions. So as we go, feel free to go over the Q&A tab, type in a question or two, and we will try to address those either as they come up or towards the end, we'll have some time for question and answer. Um, we're always happy to answer questions, preferably on topic, but you can be slightly off topic if you need to. Um, and here's the results coming in. So the majority of you still just learning about containers and Kubernetes and then the other largest bit being uh, using it in production. This, this tends to be the spread that we've seen, although I'm a little surprised by the number of people just still in the learning about phase. But uh, if you're gonna be learning about Kubernetes, learn about the guardrails now. Uh, there's a lot of organizations out there who buy our software just so they avoid making all the common mistakes that people do. So uh, we'll give that about five more seconds. Oh, nope, never mind. we're all done. We're all done with that poll. It's uh, good. We've got one more poll later on, so we'll we'll we'll, we'll keep coming. Um, thank you for sharing. So, real quick, what are guardrails? We have a dictionary definition here: um, a strong fence at the side of a road or in the middle of an expressway, intended to reduce the risk of serious accidents, or a rail that prevents people from falling off or being hit by something. So, I think this is obvious to probably at least most native. English speakers, there's, uh, whether you're that or not, but that's what a guardrail is, right? You're, there's something going on and you want something, a guardrail in place just to keep you a little safer, keep you from messing up. And uh, you know, here's a real messed up bent guardrail, but literally this is the job of the guardrail is to take the brunt of the accident so that you don't go over the side and uh, have serious bodily harm, harm, serious bodily injury, right, Robert? I'm, I'm exactly. getting the idea, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think the, uh, the corollary there is that it will also prevent you from going off-roading if you're like, you know, a really adventurous type. Having those guardrails there might be a little frustrating to you if you really want to live life on the edge. Um, but it's really important for the 99.9% .9 of us that would rather just stay on the road and, uh, you know, not. Yes, yes. Very good. So that's, yeah, let's start right there. So why, what are Kubernetes guardrails and why do we care? Um, and to your point, Robert, I think I, I want to start right there, that uh, there is a class of people out there who um, they want a Wild West in their Kubernetes environment. They want to be able to do anything. They want to be able to go anywhere. They want to be able to SSH into a specific container and make a change while it's running live in production, uh, even though we would probably encourage you not to do that in most situations, um, you know, or, or set crazy network policy or... Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a group of people out there who are building things in Kubernetes. They want to go off-road. They want to go around the guardrails. They want to be able to do anything they can. But that's not the case for the vast majority of people. And uh, talk, talk a little bit about why that is, Robert. Yeah, so, I mean, if you're an engineering team of one or, you know, if you're, if you're the only person who interacts with your Kubernetes clusters and, you know, all your development teams are just handing things off to you, you probably don't really need or want guardrails because they're just going to slow you down and you already know you know everything there is to know about kubernetes you're not going to screw up your own environment um, where guardrails are really handy is when you have many different people who are interacting with the kubernetes cluster which is a very typical and, and recommended um, setup for an organization is that you have an ops team that's in charge of the core kubernetes cluster and you have a bunch of development teams who are able to deploy to a specific namespace or deploy specific resources to that cluster so, you know, this is, this is the idea of DevOps is the development teams get to own their release process. Um, they get to own how their application runs in production. Um, and when you're doing that, when you're giving those teams that responsibility um, to deploy their own resources to the cluster, you need to make sure that, uh, you know, they're set up for success, that they're not able to do things that they shouldn't be able to do, right? Um, and so, you know, at a, at a very uh, high level, that could be just like role-based access control that says like, okay, you know, development teams can't like delete anything out of the Kube system namespace, which is going to, you know, completely blow up the cluster. Um, they can only interact with things inside of their application namespace, that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, it, it also comes into, uh, you, can, you can get a lot more fine grained with it saying, you know, I don't want my application team to deploy things as root. I don't want them to, um, you know, do any, any other thing that might, uh, you know, tip over the cluster, tip over their application. We want to make sure that all our development teams are adhering to best practices, adhering to our company standards, that sort of thing. And when I'm when I'm Joe developer, just just your average developer, particularly in an environment where 
there is service ownership and it's my job to build my application, ship my application through CICD, make sure my application's up and running in a testing environment or in production. I don't wanna have to know Kubernetes inside and out. I wanna know Node or Go or whatever the language is that I'm responsible for writing in. And when people give me guardrails, it gives me confidence that I can go do things in production. Think about your new developer who shows up especially in organizations that are like really cloud native, cloud first, constant, you know, uh, constantly delivering. And you show up in the organization, everyone's like, welcome, day one, you're gonna push code through to production. If there's no guardrails, that is terrifying, right? Uh, it's it's uh, giving somebody way too high powered of a car and uh, a very tight windy roads that they've never driven before and saying good luck. So there's, um, you're going to have significant benefit from having really good guardrails. People are going to feel safer in what they're doing by having good guardrails. So uh, it's going to prevent developers from accidentally introducing risk. And a developer does not want to introduce risk. They don't want to mess anything up. They just want to ship their code. And so, um, you know, it's the same with wasting cloud resources. Okay, sometimes your developer wants to waste cloud resources because they want to over-provision things so they don't have to worry about it. But... Uh, if you can give them guardrails that says, here's how to provision it the right way, uh, that's gonna help give them confidence as well. So all of these things, there's, there's times where guardrails are annoying for a very small percentage of the population. But the rest of the time, I mean, when I'm driving around a windy road and I think of, I live near the mountains in Colorado and uh, I think of one specific road that's here and if I'm going up that road, uh, my family is pretty freaked out the whole time I'm driving, even if I'm going slow as heck. But uh, when there are guardrails, everybody feels better about it, myself included, because they're kind of hairy roads. Uh, yeah. Anything more to say about that? Why, like the, we've talked about what they are. We've talked about why we care. I think we've also talked about why developers care. Touch for a second, Robert, before we move on, on why your executives care for you to have implemented Areas. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a great question. Um, the big the big things that uh, you know are going to uh, bubble up to the executive team uh, if they become problems are reliability issues, things like your your applications going down, customers complaining because they can't access your app, or you're losing revenue because your store is not you know available for purchases. Uh, things like security issues. Um, so you know if somebody breaks in, steals all your customer data, that can be an issue, and guardrails can help prevent those security issues. And then also cloud cost, right? Uh, if your application is misbehaving, using a lot more memory or CPU than it should, or scaling in a way that it shouldn't, um, that can cost you, you know, potentially tens of thousands of dollars, um, yeah, if, uh, you know, per per month that it's doing this. Uh, and sometimes, you know, even just a few days of misbehavior can, um, you know, really impact your organization's budget. Um, and so those are those are things that the executive team is going to hear about if uh, if they go wrong. Uh, and they're the kinds of things that, that are easily preventable with guardrails. And guardrails also are a sort of ongoing audit. Rather than waiting for things to be in production and broken, that's like literally waiting for there to be a car accident on the side of the road and going and responding, we're putting things in place to keep that from happening. And your CISO is going to appreciate that, your CEO is going to appreciate that, your CTO is going to appreciate that, all the way up the executive chain. They don't want to wait until things are broken to go respond. They want to avoid things being broken. So this, this is a, a topic that should be near and dear to your entire organization's heart. Yeah, my, my rule of thumb, and I, I say this as a developer, is that until your development teams are complaining about the guardrails being too strict, they're probably not strict enough. Um, once you start getting a couple of complaints, like I can't deploy my app because it's you know saying I need to set X, X Y field, whatever it is, um, then you know, okay, maybe maybe our guardrails you know, can be loosened a little bit. But until you hit that point, like you probably need more structure. Typically, companies err much more on the side of not having enough card rentals. Yeah. And um, at Fairwinds, we focus on two major categories of those guardrails. One is cost and reliability, and the other is security. So we're going to talk a little bit about both of those. These are the guardrails that most people really care about. You want your application to be up. You want it to be, you know, it, it's, it's a shame and I, I, I think it's funny to say that, but it is a shame to run in the cloud and not leverage the benefits of the cloud, which is letting your usage uh, 
you know, letting your cost match your actual usage. So, so getting cost right, getting reliability right in the cloud, these are some of the highest priorities for uh, a Kubernetes environment or for people running applications in Kubernetes. But let's start there. Robert, talk to us about cost and reliability. What are some sample guardrails that, that matter and why should they matter? Yeah, so uh, the first point here talks about health probes. So liveness and readiness probes in Kubernetes are a concept uh, basically that allow you to tell Kubernetes, whether your application is healthy, whether whether it's putting or traffic, et cetera. Um, you know, if your application uh, starts up, it might need some time to say connect to a database or do some like um, operation before it's actually ready to throw traffic. You want Kubernetes to start diverting traffic to your application before that starts. Uh, and if your application, say, loses connection to its database, whatever else, um, you want Kubernetes to start diverting traffic away from that particular instance of the application to other instances that are healthier. Um, so liveness and readiness probes give your application a way to tell Kubernetes, hey, I'm healthy, hey, I'm ready to serve traffic. Um, those are super important for doing things like zero downtime deployments, um, for you know making sure you have a highly available application, things like that. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it's, it's funny, I'm, I'm laughing before I even open my mouth because it seems like an obvious thing to have liveness and readiness probes, but there are an awful lot of places who don't have liveness probes or readiness probes. I, I'm thinking of one specific example where a good friend of mine uh, who is the head of engineering for a well-known SaaS application uh, now, um, at one point I was talking to another friend about that and I was like, hey, have you heard of this product? And I went to the website to send it to him and I noticed their main website was down. And uh, I pinged the head of engineering and I'm like, hey, your website's down. And he's like, wait, what? It is? How do we not know about this? And I remember thinking, yeah, how do you not know about this? That's a problem. And, uh, you know, this is, this is, it seems obvious, but there's an awful lot of places not doing it. Uh, keep going, talk about the next one. Yeah. Um, so uh, another big class of, uh, of issues here are CPU requests and limits and memory requests and limits. Um, so this is the way developers are supposed to tell Kubernetes how much CPU and how much memory their application is expected to use per instance that's that's running. Um, this is super important because A, you want to make sure that you've requested a certain amount of CPU and memory to make sure that that is always available for your application to use. Even if, you know, right now it's idle and it's not using any CPU, um, but you know, you know, when it's got normal usage, it's going to use, say, half of a CPU. You want to make sure that half a CPU is reserved for your application to use. Otherwise, Kubernetes might uh, bin pack a bunch of applications onto this node, and it might look and say, "Oh, this application is only using one, you know, you know, zero CPUs right now, or 0 0.01 CPUs." I can put a bunch of stuff on that node, and that application tries to actually do its thing, and it has no space to move. Um, so you can tell Kubernetes always reserve half a CPU for this application. Uh, super important for reliability reasons. Uh, yeah. Similar set limits to make sure that it's not going to, uh, you know, if you have a memory leak, say, um, that Kubernetes catches that and kills that uh, particular instance of the application as the memory starts to leak, uh, so that you don't just start using gigabytes and gigabytes of memory and you use an entire node's worth of memory, uh, you know, potentially hurting other applications. Uh, and I, I, I want to say on both of those things, like, part of the beauty of Kubernetes is before Kubernetes, you had to monitor what your CPU was doing. You had to monitor what your memory was doing and stay on top of it all the time. And you had to go in and roll nodes when they were behaving poorly. Or you had to custom write the automation to monitor those things and roll those nodes. With Kubernetes, you all you have to do is set. And it's just like a line in YAML that says this is what they should be. And uh, Kubernetes does the rest for you. And so it will notice, hey, there's a problem and roll that node. Uh, or roll that container. And um, there's no reason to, like, there's no reason to not do that. In the same way, there's no reason to drive outside the lines and go down off of a hill, right? Like, you're not doing that on purpose. You're, you're, you're driving down the road thinking you're staying on the road, but, uh, and doing everything you can to stay on the road. But sometimes you make a mistake, and all it takes is a guardrail to just stop you and say, hey, you forgot a thing. Hey, Maybe don't drive off that cliff. Uh, sorry, keep going, Rob. One, one of the themes you'll notice today is that there are a lot of pieces of Kubernetes configuration that are technically optional. Kubernetes wants to make it easy for you to use Kubernetes, so you can define a very minimal deployment YAML uh, and get your application running. Um, but there are a lot of fields that uh, should be set according to best practices if you want you know, a truly reliable production-ready application. 
Um, Kubernetes will happily, you know, let you not set those fields and you really need guardrails in place to make sure that your development teams are setting those fields. So that includes liveness and readiness probes. It includes CPU requests and limits here. Um, but in addition to making sure those fields are set, you also have to make sure they're set to something reasonable, right? Uh, so we have another bullet point here for memory, uh, memory and CPU limits and requests being too high or too low. Um, if they're too high, you're probably overspending, right? If you're telling Kubernetes reserve me 10 gigabytes of memory for every instance of this application, and it only needs one gigabyte of memory, uh, you're spending 10 X more than you need to, because none of those, none, no other application can use that, that memory. Um, similarly, if you're setting it too low, the application doesn't have enough resources to do its job. Um, and, uh, you know, could potentially lead to, uh, outages or just like slowness in the application. Um, so making sure those are set properly is, is really important. Um, we have some tools that will actually look at, uh, the running application and watch how much CPU and how much memory it's using over time, uh, and then make recommendations based on that, uh, in order for you to, you know, to guide you how to, how to set your memory and CPU. Um, yeah. And, and that's something I want to touch on is some of these are binary. They're either on or they're not. Yeah. You, did you set memory requests and limits or not? That's, that's a thing you can leave this webinar and go check. Hey, have I set these things? What's harder to know is what do I set them to? What are the same defaults? And that's, that's really where Fairwinds can help. And we'll, we'll get into some of this uh, again later on. We have a whole bunch of open source and our SaaS software uh, is going to make these things obvious and easy for you. We know that people struggle with setting memory requests and limits to the right thing. It's just, it's hard to know, you, you know, I, well, I deployed my app. I think it's probably going to run, you know, but uh, it's real easy to wildly over provision or wildly under provision. And unless you have tooling that shows you what things should be, it's, it's really easy to mess that up. So yeah. you can do it. We can help. Uh, we're not the Home Depot. That's probably trademark, and I can't say that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I have in here a, a picture of um, the old style bumpers in uh, in bowling. So you know, we, we've given the imagery of the uh, guardrail on the side of the road that's supposed to keep you from dying. Um, there's also, you know, what I like about this imagery is this makes it easier to have fun when you don't know what you're doing. And when people are new to Kubernetes, uh, it's not fun if every time you're deploying something into any environment, you're just making mistake after mistake after mistake and causing all kinds of problems. Good guardrails are both there to keep you from dying. Great. Uh, but also there to like make it easier, make it more fun until you get the hang of it. You're going to eventually learn the defaults because you're going to have those guardrails in place. You're going to get better at it. You're not going to have to bounce off the inflatable guardrails at the bowling alley over and over again forever. Uh, but um, until you learn how to stay in your lane, uh, it's nice to have these these helpful things along the way. I, I recognize that this is ridiculous imagery, but it makes me happy. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that like, you know, you should be deploying as many guardrails as you can without development teams complaining, um, which makes it sound like guardrails are just a pain for development teams. But honestly, when, when guardrails are done right, they make development teams so much happier because they can do their thing, they can do their job without without worrying, without getting that knot in their stomach. Like, am I gonna take down production when I, you know, click this button or type this command? If they know they're gonna be prevented from doing anything terribly stupid, um, you know, it just, it just makes the whole process feel a lot better. Yeah, well, and where this analogy breaks down is uh, part of the fun of bowling for a senior person is like not needing the guardrails because sometimes you mess up and get a gutter ball. But in your production environment, you don't ever want to mess up and get a gutter ball. That's not part of the fun. You're trying to avoid that at all costs, all the time, every time. Uh, you don't need to like deploy a little log 4 j with a known vulnerability into your uh, production environment just to you know keep things interesting. That's not the goal. Uh, so good guardrails help make that easier. Uh, okay, let's talk about security. Shift gears. Give us some examples of uh, security problems and guardrails we should have around that. Yeah, so security is a big one with uh, with Kubernetes, where um, the default configuration for a deployment is not the most con most secure configure, uh, configuration for a deployment. Um, there are a lot of things, there are a lot of options available for how to run a Docker container inside of Kubernetes, uh, where Kubernetes is a little overly permissive sometimes, just to make sure that most applications are able to run without too much of a hassle. Uh, because sometimes uh, doing the tightest security means like modifying your Docker file, say, in order to, uh, you know, make, make it, make it happy. 
Um, so some things like our uh, Kubernetes will allow your application to run as root by default. Um, that's a flag you have to set in the security context of your deployment YAML saying, hey, I don't want this application to be allowed to run as root. Um, super important to set that because, you know, basically if somebody manages to escape the container, if it's running as root, they now have root access on the host node. They can access all the other containers. Like they can do all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, uh, and and it, it, it's important to say that's not super far-fetched. There are an awful lot of security people who spend their entire career learning how to escape containers and get root access to the node and then start to clunk around the system. And that is exactly how a malicious actor will act. Yeah, a yeah. common theme of Kubernetes security is that you want to make sure that if you have a vulnerable application, so somebody ships an app, you know, with source code that's just going to allow command execution or database access or whatever, you want to make sure that that uh, blast radius is contained, right? And this is what uh, Kubernetes security settings do really well is they make sure that if one application gets compromised, it doesn't compromise everything else that's running alongside that application. Uh, Great. So similar for things, things like uh, capabilities that can be added to a uh, um, uh, containerized application. Some are added by default. Um, some need to be added specifically. Uh, we recommend just dropping all capabilities unless you have you know, special needs there for, for your particular application. Um, another, another class of security vulnerabilities though is around uh, vulnerable Docker images. So you are probably building your Docker images say from Alpine or an Ubuntu image or maybe like a, a Node.js image or something like that. And you might be installing applications on top of that. And at any point in the Docker build process, there might be known vulnerabilities that are getting introduced there. Um, so it's possible to you know, scan all the images uh, against the database of known vulnerabilities and make sure that the images that you're deploying into Kubernetes don't have any critical vulnerabilities or hopefully don't have any vulnerabilities at all. Um, so making sure you're doing some kind of image scanning, you know, maybe blocking in CICD saying, hey, we found a vulnerability in this image, you can't continue until it gets fixed. Great. Yeah, there's, again, back to my comment at the beginning of this around your CISO will appreciate this. Um, <clears throat> one thing that platform teams, engineers do not appreciate is one more security tool that they have to log into and audit their environment. And uh, not everybody appreciates security tools at all, but the way you're going to keep your engineers happy is by integrating security tools into tooling that you already use. And every developer is used to every developer. Every developer at a fast moving cloud native environment with CICD integrated is used to CICD tools. Um, and integrating into something like CI or CD um, so that the developers living in a workflow that they already understand, uh, getting feedback in a place they're used to getting feedback, that's the kind of thing that enables service ownership, doesn't make your developers angry, and keeps your CISO happy because it's tooling that they're gonna actually use. So um, that's significant from the security side. Okay, let's keep going. I, I Well, did you have anything else to say, Robert? I was gonna say that the like the word for that is is the, the idea of shifting left, right? Um, it's, a, it's a very yeah. important thing that the, the worst things companies do is they'll, developers will ship then the security team will see on a dashboard like, oh, X happened. And then they'll file a ticket against the development team. The development team has to context switch from whatever they've started doing and go back to the thing they already shipped. It just creates this feedback loop that you know is, is super slow and just causes a lot of pain. Um, and so shifting those findings left early in the development process so that they get caught before they get into production, A, means you're more secure, and B, means you know, you're, you're moving faster because your developers aren't constantly context switching. Yeah. So I, I only have one more image of guardrails that I'm going to pull through, but I get a big kick out of these. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull this up. But the, the background on this image is, uh, I'm a developer who's 15 years into my career. I've deployed into all kinds of environments, but never to Kubernetes. I've heard terrifying stories about Kubernetes. I'm supposed to go deploy something that I've never, you know, I, I haven't had to put it in the container myself. I haven't had to configure that container. I have not had to set, you know, the, the policies that keep, uh, give it, I have never had to set policy or set uh, the settings on my container to keep it from having insecure capabilities, whatever, all of these things. 
can be overwhelming. It's a little like trying to cross a bridge like this for the very first time if there's no railings on, right? This is a terrifying thing to do, period, even with railings. But at least you've got something to hold on to and you can go real slow, take your time, it's good guardrails, right? You don't feel like you're gonna die. If this bridge existed without those uh, guardrails, it, you, it would be certain death. And um, I think that's, that it's, it's an apt description for a lot of reasons. Um, yeah, anything I'm missing there before I go on? I love this picture, it makes me happy. <laughs> no, that's a good picture. 54% um, of organizations are leaving over half their workloads open to privilege escalation. Uh, unless you're chasing Indiana Jones across the bridge. That's true. But uh, I try as a general rule in my day job at work using Kubernetes to never chase Indiana Jones, just, just as a general rule. 54% um, of companies are leaving over half their workloads open to privilege escalation and thus security holes. This is um, from a Kubernetes bench, benchmark report that we've, we've put together across lots and lots of organizations. So there's a lot of organizations out there that are not securing their workloads leaving them open to privilege escalation. The reason that that's easy to do is lack of guardrails. It's interesting. When you when you look at the benchmark report there, which I think we might link to later uh, for folks who want to download it, um, but you typically see for a lot of these settings, especially the ones that aren't set by default, a very like, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, binomial distribution. You basically see two, two big spikes. One where, you know, the big enterprises who are good at guardrails, um, are uh, you know fixing all of these issues, and then you see a spike at the other end with the companies that uh, you know aren't setting any guardrails at all, or just living fast and loose, and all of their workloads are totally exposed. Um, so you can see some companies care care very deeply, and some companies don't know enough to to care or to put in the guardrails. Have same defaults. Get the same defaults from people who can give you same defaults. Use software to enforce the same defaults so that you don't have to build it all from scratch. Uh, we can help. Um, okay, I'm gonna keep going. So where do we implement the guardrails? This is, this is uh, helpful for talking about, um, I mean, the different stages that all need guardrails. And Robert, let's, let's talk through this uh, diagram briefly. Yeah, so we, we really see three, three major points where there should be some kind of guardrails or checks in place. Um, the furthest left you can go in CICD. Um, so you're probably storing your infrastructure as code or your Docker files, et cetera, inside of a Git repository. Uh, hopefully you are. Um, when those change, when somebody makes a pull request, uh, you should be scanning the changes in that pull request to see if they're gonna introduce any new issues. And then uh, you can add feedback to that pull request uh, using those scanning tools, you can say, um, you know, you can maybe block the pull request and say, you know, these are hard, hard stops. Like you can't introduce an image with critical vulnerabilities um, or you can't run a container as root, whatever it is. Um, so you can block the pull request there. You can also just surface a warning there and say, hey, you know, you didn't set your CPU limits. We strongly recommend you set your CPU limits um, and still allow that pull request to go through. Um, so you can kind of configure how, how strict you want to be at this, you know, earliest stage in the cycle. Um, and so that, that's the Git repo to the continuous integration process where, you know, you're constantly scanning that infrastructure as code repo, providing feedback to the developers at pull request time and at merge time to say, here, here are the issues that were introduced here uh, and blocking things that are, that are big problems. Yeah. Wait, before, before you go on, Robert, I do just want to say, hey, I see that there are questions coming in. Uh, I do see these questions. We will get to these questions. Uh, there's a better place a little bit later on to answer these two. So. Um, but uh, please keep the questions coming. I like it when we get questions in these. So keep going, Robert. Well, so the, the next stage in the process is, you know, maybe your infrastructure is code changes, your PR got merged. Um, they're now in the main branch of your repository. Uh, and now they're going to get shipped off somewhere through a CD process. Um, there's probably a Docker image that gets shipped to an image repository uh, and maybe some deployment that goes into a Kubernetes cluster. Um, what you want to have is uh, something sitting at the admission um, uh, point in this process that's, you know, basically sitting, um, you know, typically an admission controller inside of a Kubernetes cluster, watching everything that's coming into that cluster. And it has an opportunity to say, I'm going to reject this and not allow this into the cluster. Um, so this is super important for like your, your highest priority things that you never want to see shipped into your cluster. 
um, say like a container running as root or a privileged container, um, uh, the admission controller gets a chance to say, I'm not going to allow this in. Uh, this is important in case, you know, somebody maybe force merges something into your Git repository to kick off that CD process, or you've got an engineer who circumvented your infrastructure as code repository and is just like typing things on the command line, maybe an automated process that's like trying to pull in a new deployment. Um, the, the admission controller, I like to think of as like a bouncer for your cluster uh, or like a customs control for your cluster. Um, you know, they're, they're checking every package that's coming in and making sure there's nothing illegal in here. Um, Which to, to me, what I picture is uh, your organization sets in place all of this policy and CICD catches 95% of anything that would be a problem. But you've got two or three rogue engineers who really believe they're better than whatever the policy is and they can just skirt around it. Or, I mean, honestly, the less nefarious uh, example of that is you had a production issue Somebody is up late at night trying to just push something in real quick to fix it. And they know the way around the CI process, so they're just going to push it in. But it turns out they're deploying something with a known vulnerability. And like, you also don't want to fix a problem with another big problem. Uh, and so, that, you know, yeah, there's, there's a reason to have this extra step. But uh, keep going, Robert. Yeah, typic typically uh, we'll see companies have much... Um, We'll have many more checks at the CI/CD phase um, and be a little less strict at the admission phase, right? You want to kind of surface those warnings early on in the process uh, and, you know, hope that you catch them all there. And then, you know, basically only the things that you definitely never want to see in your cluster sit at the admission phase um, because it's a lot it's a lot easier to deal with problems at the Git phase um, than when like a cluster is telling you you can't deploy and, you know, you've got an outage and you're trying to fix things. Yeah. So, right. And then runtime. So the, yeah, the third the third piece of the puzzle here is to make sure you're continuously scanning the things that are already in your production environment. Um, so say you know you have an image that's getting deployed, you've scanned it in CI/CD. There were no vulnerabilities found. You deployed into production. The production cluster is running it, and then you know two days later, a new CVE gets announced. It turns out that image really is vulnerable. We just didn't know it at the time. You want to make sure you're continuously scanning everything inside the cluster. And surfacing up that new newly found vulnerability so that you know this image that got deployed two days ago now it's vulnerable we need to go back and you know fix it and go through this process again uh, so making sure you constantly have eyes on on you know kind of this the, the um, true state of things inside the cluster is super important uh, it may not fit under the guise of, of guardrails specifically because you know it's already in production uh, we can no longer really stop it from being a problem um, but you need to know that those problems exist so that you can kind of go back to the beginning of your process and fix them. Yeah, I mean, the, I keep using the log4j example, but, uh, you know, there's there was a day where you could ship log4j and it would pass CI, CD, even if you're scanning for vulnerabilities, and it would pass the admission controller, even if you're scanning for that, and it would be running in runtime totally fine. And the next day, it's running with a known uh, issue, and you want runtime to also be aware of that. Right? You can deploy everything just fine, and you can still have problems running in runtime because things we notice problems later on, and so you want to make sure you have a way to check for all of those things. Um, yeah, another. Go ahead. I was going to say another important uh, piece of the runtime part is that uh, if you have a new policy you want to deploy, say you want to make sure all your laps, all, all your apps are are labeled with a cost center code. Uh, you want to get eyes on okay what what apps do I have currently running that don't meet this policy that are suddenly going to get blocked in deployment when I deploy this policy? Uh, so you can kind of run that policy against your live infrastructure for a little bit uh, just to see who's who's fixed it so far, et cetera, before you start like blocking an admission control for any app that doesn't have a cost center code. Uh, and it lets you kind of like roll things out slowly and have a, have a sense for the impact once you put it in blocking mode. Yeah, which to be clear, Guardrails in this situation in runtime do not go in and kill everything that's not acting right. It bubbles it up. You don't want to. You don't want to have an automated way to start shutting everything down unless you're really good with the chaos monkeys. Um, okay, so let's talk about how to implement guardrails. I've hinted at several different things here, uh, and we are going to talk about some of our open source, um, some ways to write custom policy, and then also our software for handling this at scale of multi-cluster environments. Um, yeah, start with the overview, Robert, and then I'm going to go to one of the questions that we had come in because it's specific to this. Yeah, so, um, you know, implementing guardrails at each step in this process and CICD and emission control 
and inside a live running cluster uh, is not super easy to do, especially if you want to run the same checks in each environment and kind of customize how each check runs, whether it's in block mode or, or passive mode, that kind of thing. Um, so we, we highly recommend um, utilizing some uh, open source or commercial tooling to help you with that process. Uh, we provide a handful of open source tools uh, that are free for anybody to use. Uh, Polaris is great for checking uh, basic deployment configuration, things like um, setting those liveness and readiness probes, setting CPU and memory settings, um, basic security settings, like not running as root. Polaris can check all those things, and it can do that, uh, again, in CICD. It can check your infrastructure as code files. Uh, in admission control, it can block uh, certain things that don't, don't meet those checks. Uh, and it can run against the live cluster to see, okay, what's already in my environment that doesn't meet those things. Uh, Goldilocks is a great tool for um, making sure you have your CPU and memory settings set just right. That's uh, so the Goldilocks name as we get it just right. Uh, it looks at the running um, application, determines how much CPU and memory it's actually using, and then compares that to the memory requests and limits, the CPU requests and limits, uh, and makes suggestions as to what those should be set to. Um, and one thing I want to add about Goldilocks is, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, Robert, but uh, it leverages data that Kubernetes is already collecting in the vertical pod autoscaler. And so you can install Goldilocks and immediately get suggestions. You don't have to install it and let it run for a week before you get suggestions. You can, you can run Goldilocks and immediately pull out meaningful data that's actually accurate, assuming you've been running Kubernetes for more than five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other two that we offer here are Nova and Pluto, uh, and they check for uh, Nova checks for outdated and deprecated Helm charts. So if there are updates there that are available, it can kind of force you to update. Uh, and Pluto uh, will check for deprecated or removed API versions. So Kubernetes, as they release new minor versions, uh, 1.22 is a big one where they removed a bunch of old API versions, and suddenly all your deployments are going to break if they haven't been fixed uh, to use the new API version. So Pluto can check for those things. Um, we also uh, uh, suggest if you have custom policies, so all the, all the ones we've talked about um, really have like a built-in set of best practices that they check for. Um, if you have custom things, like we talked about maybe having a custom cost center code on every single deployment, uh, if you have things that are really specific to your organization and aren't things that other organizations are already gonna have built, um, you can use OPA and actually Polaris now also has support for custom checks. Um, so you can write your own your own checks uh, to you know make sure your company name is tagged on every deployment, whatever it is you want to do with your company. Uh, you can have that set up. And I, I want to add too, you can write custom policy in Polaris as well. Um, Polaris has a way to do that. So OPA has kind of become the standard for custom policy, but um, Polaris has been around since even before that, and so we've had a way to write custom policy there as well. There's some things about the way that Polaris's custom policy code works that might be easier to approach, uh, but uh, that's that's a personal opinion. So you can you can check out both. The general trade off there is, is OPA uh, is, is much more powerful. It's basically a whole programming language, but Polaris covers 95% of the use cases um, with a much simpler syntax. Uh, it uses JSON schema, which is um, a standard that's used by Kubernetes to validate things. Yeah. Um, and then talk about multi-cluster environments with Fairman's Insights. Yeah, so each of these uh, solutions on the open source side of things is uh, fairly easy to deploy for a single cluster, for a small use case, for a single development team, that kind of thing, single application. Uh, once you get to bigger environments and you're deploying these uh, these uh, policies across many different clusters or enforcing them across many different development teams, uh, things start to get a little bit more hairy. You know, development team A needs an exception for this particular policy. You want to make sure these policies run in production, but not staging or run in your EU clusters, but not your North America clusters. Things start to get very complicated in, uh, in larger environments. Um, and in that case, it can be easier to use a centralized uh, commercial system uh, that can take in all these policies and federate them out to different locations. Uh, it can run, you know, the same policies across all your CICD environments, all your admission controller environments. Uh, all your in-cluster scanning, um, and they can be configured on a, on a per-cluster basis, a per-namespace basis, that sort of thing. Um, so we actually built Fairwind Insights, our commercial product, with this idea in mind. Um, it's basically a, um, a platform that any open source tooling can plug into. Uh, we have plugins for each of the open source tools listed here, so Polaris, Goldilocks, Pluto, OPA, um, uh, some other ones like KubeBench and KubeHunter, um, Trivi, Container scanning, um, those all plug into Insights, and then Insights can make sure they run consistently 
uh, across all three stages of the development cycle. So CICD, admission control, and in cluster scanning, and across your entire fleet of clusters, your your you know all your repositories, that sort of thing. Uh, make it really easy to configure all these different checks uh, for each specific environment. Yeah, and I'm going to show you that in just a second, so we can hang on. Um, and Robert, you broke up with for me there for just a second. Am I clear for you before I go on? You are clear, yeah. Okay. Uh, so one of the questions that came through, and let's answer this now, and then we'll dive into a demo of insights and come back to the other questions. But uh, it says, we have GitLab as CI/CD platform, SAST scan, DAST, dependency, container scans, et cetera, are all familiar terms. We are in the early stages of rolling out security for containers. Do you have any specific guidelines on top five things, say RBAC, secret management for container security? And, and I don't know if you want to list your top five priorities, but maybe where to go, like what, even some of these tooling, like what's the best way to get some of the top five priorities in a default way? Yeah, so I'll, I'll try and come up with five off the top of my head. Uh, I think you you hit two uh, perfectly there, one, one being RBAC. I think is one of the first things you want to do. Um, that's less around container security and more around the security of your Kubernetes environment. Um, you know, making sure uh, different personas within your organization aren't able to do things that they you know shouldn't need to be able to do. You know, a developer needs to be able to do less than a platform engineer, and you probably want to reserve the most you know important things like being able to exec into a pod or like a cluster admin kind of thing. Like you know, only the, the handful of the break glass type uh, type people. Um, Secrets management is another big one. Just making sure that you're not uh, including secrets inside of like a hard coded environment variable so that it's just there for anybody to see that you're using Kubernetes secrets, that you're encrypting them in your infrastructure as code. Uh, super important. Uh, another one I'll say is just container scanning with a tool like Trivi, uh, making sure you're checking for known vulnerabilities inside your container images. Super important. Um, Kubernetes uh, configuration security, so making sure you're not running containers as root making sure you're not allowing privilege escalation, things like that. Those are things that Polaris can help check for. Uh, I think that gets me to four. Um, and then another <laughs> I, will, uh, I will say, which is a little bit more advanced. Um, we don't see every company do it, but it's, it's definitely a good idea. Um, if you're a PCP company, it's work well. Uh, making sure, you know, by default, and we, have, we have another question that touches on this. Every, every other pod. Um, and it's it's good it's a good idea to start to tighten that down because in most cases you know application A doesn't need to talk to application B doesn't need to connect to application B's database uh, and so making sure uh, you have uh, probably like a deny by default policy um, specifically allows okay this application can reach these external domains this application is able to serve travel to the outside world uh, you know this microservice is allowed to talk to this microservice that sort of thing. Yeah. Great. So also, we have a software, we have an open source project for managing RBAC called RBAC Manager. Uh, there's, we have other open source as well that addresses some of these things, but um, go, go check out our GitHub and, and you can see a bunch of those married together. But let's dive into a quick demo. I'm going to give, this is, the software I'm about to show you, Fairwinds Insights, is a very um, comprehensive piece of software already in a lot of ways. There is a lot that you can do with it. And I can't show you everything in the brief period that we have. Uh, my hope is to whet your appetite. If you're interested in seeing more, reach out and we can show you more in depth. But um, let's dive in and, and let me give you an overview. So uh, when you log into Fairwinds Insights, this is what you're gonna see. Well, I've, I've actually already clicked on clusters instead of home, but I've got an overview of all of my clusters uh, an overall health score for each cluster, as well as the number of action items that are uh, need to be addressed in each cluster. And then I have an overall health score for my entire organization. So if I click into one of these, and I've actually got this pulled up, Proxima Prod. So here's one of the clusters uh, that I could dig into and I get an overview of this particular cluster. So everything above the line is when action items are introduced to the cluster. And everything below the line is when we have knocked out some of those action items. So you can see, you know, that in theory, we're improving this cluster over time. Uh, and, you know, you can see the health score used to be 89. Today it's 91. Um, that's why we have an A minus on this. We're checking for a whole bunch of different things. Only 26 issues are critical. Most, you know, the vast majority of things that we're checking for are actually passing. We do have some cost analysis on here as well, which I'll get into in a second. So where is this all coming from? 
Uh, we're pulling reports from a whole bunch of different places, and Robert touched on this. Polaris is our software. Nova, Pluto, he already gave you a high-level overview for. But we do include Trivi for container vulnerabilities, KubeBench, KubeHunter, and uh, we also support Open Policy Agent in uh, Fairwinds Insights. So that will roll all up into a big, long list of action items. And uh, right now, I'm looking across the entire organization, but you can filter by category or by severity or all of the above. You can look at specific clusters. And if you click into any issue, it's going to tell you both what the issue is, a description of it, as well as how to go about fixing it. So you don't have to be a super senior engineer in order to be able to dig through this and knock issues off. Now, uh, if you're like me and you uh, work, you know, well, I, I, I'm not on the platform team, but uh, if I was on a platform team, I would not want to have a gigantic list of all the things my organization did wrong with no way of improving it other than just waiting for Kendall to go knock through this list. And so this is why we've spent so much time talking about guardrails. When you shift this left into the CICD pipeline or into the admission controller level, uh, now you've put guardrails around instead of waiting for things to be broken in production and response. So rather than being a help desk that people call because, hey, 911, I drove off the side of the road uh, or, you know, whatever, which a lot of SREs hate being help desk because people just call and say, things broke, what broke, right? Instead, you put same policy in place and it's going to live in a place that developers are familiar with. So here you can see, you know, a workflow that an engineer is going to be very familiar with. They're pushing code into GitHub. There's a pull request here and you can see CircleCI has passed the tests and Fairwinds Insights has failed. So uh, an average engineer can just live in here, click details, it's gonna load them into the UI and show them what they need to fix so that this deployment will go through. You can also uh, get there from within the GUI, you can go in, click on a repository. Here I have a repository with three critical action items uh, and I can click into this, find what those critical action items are. Oh, Trivi's telling me that I'm running something with a known CVE and it's gonna tell me how to go about fixing it. So there's, uh, this is all of that policy shifted left and you can set defaults. I wanna block um, any push, any pull request that uh, you know, has critical vulnerabilities or high or above vulnerabilities. You can set these different thresholds and keep your people from doing things you don't want them to do. Uh, we also do have some efficiency dashboards where we track cost over time. Um, you can click into specific workloads. Uh, once I select a cluster, to go quicker because we're going to wrap up a few things here and answer questions. But uh, we break down specific workloads and offer actual recommendations uh, so that you can see, hey, if I did X, Y, or Z, I would save, you know, here's, here's a, a cron job running that's costing me $19 a month. And if I took the recommendations, it would only cost me $8.95. I'd click in here and it's going to tell me what I'm actually using uh, versus what I'm requesting. And it's going to tell me the difference and what to go set it to. So this is one of those tools that we mentioned. Everybody has a hard time getting this right. We make it easy. Policy, here's the dashboard to write custom policy. You can click create, create a custom policy right within here. We have a policy wizard. We have templates. There's a whole bunch in this software that I can't go into everything. Compliance, automation. You can kick everything out to JIRA so that you're automatically creating tickets or doing, uh, you know, using a workflow that makes sense to your team, be that Slack or JIRA or whatever it is that you're using. There's a lot here. Fairwinds Insights makes it very easy to write custom policy, set defaults that are saying across your organization and enforce it across everywhere, no matter how many clusters you have. You can use open source and do that at one on one cluster with relative ease. Use some of our open source, check out Polaris as a starting point. But if you're running in a large environment, Fairwinds Insights makes this very easy. Okay, let's go back and let's address uh, a few questions here. I just gave the demo. Nope, I don't wanna do a poll yet. Uh, I wanna answer questions first. And the other question that I have here is, by default, Kubernetes provides a flat, unsegregated network where all applications in the cluster can talk to one another. Uh, any guidelines on how to lock it down or harden the container network? And you touched on this briefly, Robert, but uh, give, give somebody a, a place to go get started. Yeah, so um, so totally right. Uh, by default, Kubernetes is going to let everybody talk to everybody within the cluster. Um, you know, again, this this falls in the theme of Kubernetes wants to make your life easy, wants to make Kubernetes easy to adopt, uh, which often means uh, not shipping with the tightest security controls possible. 
Um, so we, we recommend putting in some kind of network policy in place. Um, by default, the Kubernetes network policy is pretty um, uh, low level. Uh, I think it, it, uh, you need to specify like IP addresses, uh, things like that. Uh, you don't really get those uh, like higher layer um, semantics, like being able to specify specific domains, specific paths, things like that. Um, so we also recommend using a uh, project like Linkerd uh, uh, as your network policy provider. Um, that can really help you to find sensible network policies that are a little little easier to think about, a little easier to design. Um, I think that really helps. We also suggest um, starting with a default deny policy, meaning nobody can talk to anybody. And then you slowly layer on, okay, well, this one needs to talk to the Kubernetes API. This one needs to talk to this one. Uh, this one needs uh, egress to, um, you know, some, you know, the Slack API, something like that. Um, so you start to layer on, uh, you know, the actual things your applications need. Um, that way, you know, you're basically down to uh, the kind of the principle of least privilege, right? Uh, nobody can talk to anybody unless they absolutely need that permission. Right. Okay. Uh, let's do this last poll. I'm going to send you one place to go check out some resources, and then we'll turn it back over to Cody to wrap things up. So tell us what the greatest opportunity is to improve your Kubernetes environment. Um, and uh, these questions may seem leading, but these are all things the fair ones can help you with. So it's helpful for us to know uh, if we were to reach out, what would be most useful for you. Um, yeah, I want to reiterate just, just a couple of things. Guardrails are essential. They're helpful. They give people confidence, a feeling of safety. It's worth implementing them across your organization. Fairwinds can help. If at all what we talked about today was useful to you on the open source side or the software side, we'd love to talk with you. Please reach out and uh, we can show you more in depth, talk with you specifically about your use case and see how our software can help. So uh, we'd love to have that uh, conversation if you're interested in that. Here's the results of the poll. It looks like the vast majority of you are looking at improving the security posture of your clusters, which makes sense given the topic of what we're talking about today. Uh, saving money is also up there and, and general best practices. So we do have a general best practice assessment here. You can go check out, uh, oh, no, here I'm showing our benchmark report. So we have uh, we have a benchmark report. We have a general best practices white paper. We've got a bunch of different things that you can come find from Fairwinds. Also check out our GitHub for open source. Feel free to you know go to this bit.ly, just slash Fairwinds trial and conversation with us. We will reach out and follow up. There will be a recording of this. And I'm going to wrap up. So Cody, you've got three minutes to handle a drawing. Thank you, everyone, for coming. This has been Guardrails and Kubernetes. Glad, uh, glad to be here. All yours. Thank you, Kendall. And thank you, Robert. Really appreciate both of you uh, hopping on today and sharing your expertise with us. Um, so I would like to remind our audience, make sure I'm unmuted. <laughs> We'd like to remind today's I would like to remind today's audience that this session was recorded. So following this panel, you'll receive an email with a link to access the recording on demand. You can also find the recording living on the Container Journal website. Just visit containerjournal.com slash webinars and be sure to look in the on demand section. So on to those four gift cards. This is for four $25 Amazon gift cards. Our first winner is Kelly W. Our second winner is Jonathan K. Our third winner is Christoph K. And our fourth and final winner is Mbalu K. Three last names with K. So congratulations to the four of you. Um, please keep an eye on your inbox to claim that gift card. But if you don't happen to see that email, keep an eye on your spam folder. I would like to thank Fairwinds for sponsoring today's webinar. We couldn't have done this without Fairwinds. And to our audience, we really appreciate you spending time with us today. Um, we ask for one extra moment of your time to fill out a brief post-webinar survey that should pop up on your screen here in just a moment. But otherwise, we do hope to see you at an upcoming TechStrong Learning Program. Everyone, have a great rest of your day. And Robert Kendall, thank you once more.